insolence, wild cats. Don't be so sure. Welcome back to Marvelous Videos. I'm Ryland. So, way back in the day, there was this show called Wildcats. It originally came out as a comic book series published by Image Comics. This was a company made by Jim Lee, and Wildcats was the first of their work to ever be published. This comic had actually proceeded to create a whole universe of its own, called the Wildstorm Universe. So, clearly the characters must have been quite enjoyable. But later on, the ownership of the Wildcats characters and the concept was sold to DC Comics. After this, there was a few more teams that were created. One of them, including the original Grifter and Marlow. So, in this video, we will be discussing the first and original Wildcat teams, mainly with reference to the animated show and the comics. We will go over their origins and what their roles were in the team and in the show as well. Then, we will be going into some of the other iterations of the Wildcat teams and their respective members. This is going to be a bit of a long ride, so get some popcorn or tacos and sit back and enjoy. But before we get into our explanation, we do have just one very small request. If you like our content, then please support us. By subscribing to our channel. This is just one small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thanks. Now, let's begin. Do not make threats for which you have neither the stomach nor the taste. <laughs> exploring the team members of this kick-ass group. Before I introduce the characters, let's introduce the story behind the Wildcats first. Essentially, they were an alien race called the Carabim that was trying to hunt down the last of the evil demonites. During this interstellar battle, both ships ended up crashing on Earth. Ever since this event, all those thousands of years ago, the Carabim had settled into Earth and fought the demonite threat from the shadows for millennia. Few of the original Carabim are still alive. However, since others had mingled with the human race, there were Carabim human descendants all over the world. At the time of creating the first team, roughly half of the Carabim were from the original crash all those thousands of years ago, while the other half were crossbreed descendants. Oh, and then of course there's Grifter. Over the years, the Wildcats have seen quite a few different members. However, as they say, you can't really ever forget your first, can you? There is just something different and alluring about their personalities. This makes a lot of sense considering that the people who worked on the project also had a hand in working on big titles like the X-Men. Stay back! The original Wildcats team members, Spartan. The original point of this character was that he would be a very sophisticated cyborg, basically so that if he were ever to die in the field, well, his memories could just be downloaded into another body, making him, in a sense, immortal. He looks a little bit like Cyclops from the X-Men, and to an extent, he has the attitude as well, if we're talking about the whole goody two-shoes theme and the general patriotism towards his cause. His powers and abilities were pretty nuts as well. He could fly at will and shoot his lasers from his hands. Spartan was deemed the leader of the team. There was even an episode where the entire team just wasn't functioning properly because Spartan wasn't there. Speaking of this, this brings me to one of the most important part of Spartan's backstory. Apparently, Spartan had a biological body. This is because he actually was a flesh and blood Caribbean person before his consciousness was downloaded into a cybernetic body. However, he wasn't exactly aware of this for the longest time. In fact, this was something that was kept hidden from him ever since the original crash. The fact was that before becoming a cyborg, Spartan was a Caribbean called Hadrian. In the episode where we uncover his backstory, we also see that he had been romantic involved with a human woman before. Now, upon meeting her again and being aware of his biological body, he immediately wished to leave the Wildcat cause and live the rest of his life quietly with his human lover. But then again, Jacob Marlowe convinced Spartan that even if he were to leave and live his life quietly, the Demonites would come for him soon enough. This got him thinking that maybe he should finish the fight with the Demonites so that he could live his peaceful dream. So, in that instance, he took the decision to go and help his team to fend off the Demonites. At the end of this episode, however, we see that Spartan probably came to the conclusion that he couldn't afford any distractions while he fights in the war. And in the end, we see him saying goodbye to his lover for good. And honestly, you do feel bad for the guy. In the comics, we see that Spartan's story has been played around quite a bit. In the land of Kara, a safe haven for the Carabim after the war, Spartan was among the many androids that were created in the image of a Carabim warrior called Yon Cole. He had later created an artificial intelligence for Spartan that would have had a soft spot for humans as well as Carabim. Also in the comics, we see that he had an on and off relationship with Voodoo. He even changes his name to Jack Marlowe after Jacob dies and replaces him as CEO of Halo Enterprises. Later on, there is even a stage when Spartan absorbs Void and her abilities into himself. However, after this, he resembles Vision to an extent and steps away from fighting the war. He decided that he will help the world by introducing advanced Carabim technology into human society. We guess that this was him doing his part in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> Thank you. 
Grifter. The G-Man, the Grifter. He is the only human on the Wildcats team. He isn't a descendant of the Caribbean either. In fact, he used to be a criminal who would go around pulling some really difficult jobs like stealing artifacts and robbing banks. He is the typical ex-military type of guy who had a quick and sharp tongue. He may talk a lot, but he also wields his guns with crazy precision. Unlike the demonite drones that shoot like stormtroopers. According to the comic lore, Grifter, or Cole Cash, used to be a government agent and a member of the Team 7. Once the entire team was exposed to the Gen Factor, Cole developed his powers. Zealot came in clutching here and helped Cole to deal with his newfound abilities properly. And understandably so, because if you're just a normal human trying to overcome psychic and telekinetic powers, well, you get a bit overwhelmed too. In this process, Grifter also became the first male to ever have been trained in the Coda arts. Considering Zealot was the one who created and taught the Coda to begin with, Grifter learned how to use his new powers as well as how to stow them away. It would seem that the animated series had shown Grifter to be a normal human without any special powers whatsoever. However, he was still very trained and could easily take care of himself in a fight. This was also the time that Grifter's friend Lonely was killed by Hightower, and to only make matters worse, Jacob even struck a deal with him. This greatly upset Grifter so that he would go on to become a solo agent working alone. In the animated series, there is an episode that shows a bit more of Cole's backstory. It tells the story of Lonely finally being released from prison, and Grifter is there waiting for him so that he can join the Wildcats. The interesting thing to note here is that Lonely seems to be really good at dealing with security measures, so Lonely basically broke out of prison on his last day in prison. This emphasizes that he wasn't necessarily kept there, but that he wanted to serve his time properly, and thus stayed there by choice. We also find out that Lonely was taught by Cole back when they used to work together. Although Lonely betrays Grifter in that episode, well, they do make up for it later on. That said, we do see at the end of the animated show that Grifter and Zealot fall for each other. Grifter also happens to be one of the few Wildcats that stay on the team for an extended period of time. If we go by her comics, Priscilla Katane used to be an exotic dancer until the Wildcats found her and recruited her. Voodoo is of Caribbean, human, and demonite descent. This is an especially weird combination because of the obvious race mingling, and honestly, this may also be the reason why she has the strongest telekinetic powers in the whole team. Zealot was the one who trained her in combat, although the warrior Coda was never really convinced of how Voodoo would react in a hostile scenario. Voodoo was actually quite important to the Wildcats cause because of her psychic abilities, allowing her to tell if a human was being possessed by a demonite. Later on, she even grows that power to be able to pull a demonite out of a host human body. So when fighting a war against these monsters, you can see why Voodoo is perceived to be an important asset to the cats. She has the ability to read and communicate freely through people's minds. Voodoo can even trick people by making illusions and has the ability to use psionic blasts. There isn't that much known about Priscilla's origin, except that somewhere back in her ancestry, there was an attempt to splice Caribim's DNA into a demonite body. Later on, once Voodoo had moved in with Maul, a serial killer named Samuel Smith had attacked and cut off both of Voodoo's legs. It was only after a good demonite who had opposed the Caribbean demonite war from the very start approached Priscilla and taught her how to use her powers to focus on healing and manipulating time so that she could grow her legs back. After this, Maul and Voodoo dated for a while before being split up and going their separate ways. There was a brief period when Voodoo would rejoin the Wildcats as well after the big Armageddon event, and soon after, she would get romantically involved with Spartan again. He later proposed to her as well. Oh, and we can't forget the part where Voodoo actually learns Voodoo magic and manages to talk with the dead and even raise them on occasion. In the animated show, she has a slightly different origin, probably for PG-13 reasons. Here, her parents had abandoned her as a child, and the Wildcats found her in an orphanage. She was also very evidently the weakest member of the team. Zealot wasn't very fond of her, especially because Voodoo would keep messing up on her missions. However, her ability to be able to identify demonites that have possessed human bodies hasn't been missed. This is probably why she's the most important of the team no matter what. It doesn't really matter that much if she's not a fighter. She still provides a lot of value to the team. Later, she also becomes able to force demonites out of their possessed bodies using her powers. Another interesting thing we see that is honestly quite refreshing for a show made so long ago is Voodoo's relationship with Maul. Apparently, Voodoo and Maul were recruited together and have gotten closer ever since. <laughs> Zealot. 
Zealot. Zealot was one of the original Caravim warriors from the crash all those years ago. She was a Caravim and a Coda warrior. In fact, she was the one who actually trained and taught the Coda their skills and principles. In the comics, we see that Zealot had lived for thousands of years and is a fierce and unforgiving fighter. She has had numerous relationships with Caravim and humans alike over the years, but one does stand out, and that is her on and off situation with the Grifter. In Kara, however, she was forced to have a child with Majestros. However, giving birth reduced her social standing, and she wouldn't be allowed to fight again. This is where her mother came in and lied to everyone about Zealot's child being dead at birth. Instead, the public was told that the child was actually Zealot's mother, Harmonies. This led the child, Savant, to be raised as Zealot's sister. Zealot has had bad blood with the Coda that she has trained because they were more money-minded than she was. To be honest, they were perhaps more realistic in a way that made sense to them. The Coda wanted to become the most powerful and expensive band of mercenaries in the world. On the other hand, Zealot was all about fighting the war against the Demonites and had a code of honor that she followed. Since her interests were conflicting to say the least, they parted ways, but would sometimes clash if their missions overlapped. The actions of the Coda are something that she blames herself for, to such an extent that after a point, she even fakes her own death to be able to go and correct her mistakes. She even went on to covertly try and kill the remaining Coda. In the animated show, Zealot is a high-nosed individual who is more disciplined and stricter than the others. She probably doesn't believe in having fun on the job no matter what either. Hard to even remember a time where we see her laughing, and since she was the most serious on the team, she would often get into arguments with Voodoo, since she was very clumsy. One of our favorite parts in the show is when Zealot thought Grifter was killed trying to save her. This sent Zealot into such a rage that she stopped listening to anyone and everyone, and was only out for vengeance. This bit was especially shocking, because if you sit and watch the episodes, you can actually tell that the animations are meant to be childish, and not too rough. However, when we see Zealot's face after she sees Grifter supposedly dead, it is truly a sight to behold. It seemed so out of place for such a scary face to be seen in the show, but at the same time, it was so fitting. Once Zealot went around hunting down the demonites in her rage, we could actually see the demonites run for their lives with utter fear. So yeah, don't mess with Zealot or any of her close friends. Power. Get real, lady. I'm no space freak. Void. Void, originally known as Adriana Tereskova, was a Russian cosmonaut whose ship had crashed into an orb of power. This imbued her with near-celestial powers, and she became Void. She had the ability to see the future and teleport anyone to and from anywhere. As she grew older, she became less and less human, implying at least that her human host had passed on. There was a small period in which Void existed without a host, after which Noir attacked her, and she basically disintegrated. However, this was not before Jack Marlowe managed to absorb Void's powers into himself. In the animated show, Void has no humanity, so to speak, since she is just a living supercomputer. She doesn't have any backstory and is only referred to by Marlowe as a computer. She is the main source of information for the Wildcats team, much like an oracle. She knows when the demonites are moving and where they're going. She can instantly teleport the whole team whenever and wherever they need to go instantly, although there are some restrictions. Wildcat! Okay, how about a game of catch? Maul. According to the comics, Maul is a hybrid between a titanthrope and a human. He can increase his size at will, although the bigger he gets, apparently the more he loses brain cells. What we mean to say is that the comics say that he loses any reasoning capabilities the bigger he grows. Maul, or his real name Dr. Jeremy Stone, was a Nobel laureate, and at some point he also discovers that he could become smarter by reducing his size, although this was really exhausting for him. Okay, we're just gonna come out and say this. He is basically the Hulk. The fact that he is a giant green dude with purple accents doesn't exactly help his case either. In the animated show, there was even a mention of how the bigger he gets, the angrier he becomes. This is technically the opposite of what happens with the Hulk, but the net effect is still the same. He seemed to have a very intimate relationship with Voodoo, considering they joined the team at around the same time. Not only that, but it just seemed to make sense that they would be drawn to each other because they weren't as involved in the Wildcat cause as the others, like Zealot or Spartan. In general, Maul is a sweetheart, and even keeps the flowers that Voodoo gave him the first time they went out together. Often, we we see if Voodoo is possessed or if Maul loses control of his power, the other person would intervene and calm them down. Again, this seems a lot like the Hulk and Black Widow, at least from the MCU anyway. But aside from this parallel, the relationship is actually quite cute. We don't get the story behind how Maul got his powers, because in the animated series, he is half Caribbean, and that is what turned him into the creature that he is now. Meaning, there is no mention of a titan trope in the show whatsoever. However, we do see that Maul, or Jeremy, used to be the son of a great archaeologist. Many years ago, when Jeremy was still 
human child, his father and he would go to a dig site where Jeremy would almost lose his life. His father would be the one who jumped into a pit with a rope and saved him. In this same episode, we also find out that once Jeremy had changed, he ran away from home without a word to his family. He used to hold his father in very high esteem, and so he was ashamed of his transformation. He believed that his father would resent him and reject him because of his appearance. However, later on, they do make up once Jeremy's father realizes that Maul is actually his long lost son. Once again, proving that we all just want our fathers to tell us they're proud. Taking this lion down, let's give them some of their own. Warblade, mind if I cut in? Warblade's signature line in the animated show may be very on the nose and even a little cringe right now, but things like this are what makes a kid's show like this so great. Warblade was the first character that we see in the animated series of Wildcats. The first episode starts with him being chased down by both Demonites and the Wildcats. Turns out that the Demonites figured out that the Wildcats wanted to recruit him, so they thought it would be best to remove him from the scene before he could become a problem. However, the Wildcats were successful in their rescue and the recruitment operation. Warblade, or Reno Bryce, Rice didn't actually take the change instantly. In fact, he was confused and scared and he ran away. Considering he was just an ordinary human who was really good with technology and did martial arts in his spare time, all of the bodily changes that he was forced to undergo in the Wildcat headquarters well, didn't exactly sit well with him. All of a sudden, he sees that he's lost control over his fingers, his arms, and even his legs. Understandably scared, he runs and hides. However, later on, Warblade gets possessed by one of the Demonites and is saved by Voodoo. This puts things in a perspective for him, and he joins the Wildcats willingly. His powers lie in his ability to control his body like liquid metal, basically like that Terminator who came back from the future. And let's be honest, if you're old enough to have seen this show when it came out, you know exactly which Terminator I'm referring to. In the comics, we also see that he had an artistic side to him, so he could often be seen making sculptures or visiting art galleries. His body is extremely resilient to most attacks and has a very high resistance to heat as well, and although he is separated from the team in between, after Armageddon, even he rejoined the Wildcats. Freeze! What the? Lord Emp. Lord Emp is a Carabim Lord who has been around for a long time. It is likely that he has been on Earth since the very first crash landing and has taken up many personas over the years, as he is back to the anti-demonite efforts from the shadows. Now, he is the CEO of Halo Enterprises and has formed the Team Wildcats as a direct opposition force to the demonites. This guy reminds us a lot of Charlie from Charlie's Angels because he basically takes care of the Wildcats. He is mainly the leader of their side in the war and advises them on what to do and what not to do. It is usually best to follow his instructions considering how many thousands of years of experience that he has in dealing with these monster invaders. His name, as of now, is Jacob Marlowe. In a process known as Ascension, he asked Spartan to take his life, which he did. Through this process, Jacob ascended into becoming an alien being from his earlier human form. The Secondary Savants Team Members Once the original team, the Wildcats, was presumed to be dead, this new team was formed in its place. From what we know, either the original members had died, or they had gone back to Kara, the Karabim homeland. The other thing to note is that unlike the other Wildcat teams, these guys weren't exactly just fighting the Demonites. Instead, their agenda was more general crime fighting. So, this was something that differentiated this particular team of Wildcats from the others. Savant. Savant was the daughter of Zealot and Mr. Majestic. There was a bit of controversy regarding Savant's birth because Zealot's standing in Kara was questioned after she had given birth. As I mentioned before, she ended up being raised as Zealot's sister. But unlike her mother slash sister, you know what I mean. Savant was much more interested in archaeology and ecology. She even went on to work at the Smithsonian Museum for a while. Savant's main powers lie in the artifacts that she carries and discovers along her journey. Out of these, she has seven league boots, which are basically boots of teleportation, and a bag that has infinite space inside it. I mean, she literally carries entire rooms inside this bag. Mr. Majestic. Majestic was one of the few Carabim who was stuck on Earth since the crash as well. He was also the strongest Carabim warrior that we knew for some time. This was because his powers essentially made him comparable to Superman. He could fly, use laser beams, and had crazy strength and endurance as well. He also had some telekinetic abilities and knows his way around a sword. In the animated show, he made a small appearance where he was posing as a good guy so he could take over the world after destroying the Demonites. However, the original Wildcat group managed to stop him. 
Condition Red. Condition Red, or Max Cash, was Grifter's younger brother. According to the comics, Max had followed his older brother and joined a military force for international operations. He would go undercover after this to assassinate police officers and other individuals without his supervisor's knowledge. This was all working out well for him, considering he was such an amazing marksman. However, Savant found out about this and decided to use this information to blackmail him into working with her and joining the team of Wildcats. He later left the Wildcats and joined the Puritans, who were basically a cult that wanted to completely remove all alien life on Earth. During this journey, he fell for one of the Puritans named Gina Medici. However, he betrayed her and the other Puritans by snitching on the Wildcats about their plans. After a fight where they had gone back in time, Max had left Gina in the past, long before she was even born. In an ultimate plot to exact her revenge, she joins a group of Coda and asks that they attack him a thousand years later. So, when Max used his time-traveling device to come back to his own timeline, well, there's a Coda assassin there waiting to end his life. Lady Tron. Lady Tron was basically a cyberpunk straight out of Night City. Cybernetic augmentations, low-key psychosis, and murderous tendencies are just what she came with. But Tao managed to reprogram her so that she would be normal. Yes, we do realize that normal is subjective, but you get the point. After the programming, she joined the Wildcats team. There was another cyborg very similar to her, whom she looked up to a lot, called Overkill. She had also had a massive crush on Max Cash. However, he never really reciprocated those feelings. It is also implied, to an extent, that one of the times that Max had left was in part due to this unrequited love. Once Tao was revealed to be evil, he remotely disabled Lady Tron's body. After that, she was taken into the Church of Gort. This was apparently some cult-like group that worshipped cybernetics and robotics, so she did fit in there for quite a while before she was cast out because she still retained some organic parts in her body. Later on, there would be a scene where Samuel Smith, the serial killer we mentioned earlier, would do damage so extensive that she would have to be permanently shut down. Her data and consciousness were downloaded into the Halo mainframe, where Grifter used her body to fight with the team, since he was bound to a wheelchair. Tao. Tao was a human who was created in a lab. He was artificially created to be able to become a tactical genius of supreme magnitude. He is artificially persuasive, and his intuition is almost never wrong. However, soon enough, we find out that Tao doesn't exactly have the purest of intentions. In fact, he was trying to manipulate the Wildcats into starting a war with post-human criminals. The objective behind this was to increase the size of the Wildcat army, which he would later control for his own devices. But then again, his meddling was discovered before long, and it would seem that Mr. Majestic was the one who would chase him down and end him. However, later we find out that it wasn't really Toe that Majestic had killed, but rather a shapeshifter that Tao had somehow convinced to believe that he was the actual Tao. The next time he appeared, he took his plans a step further. He planned to topple governments, worldwide institutions, and even secret societies. Yes, he really was relentless. The Savant Guard Team There was a time when Savant had left the Wildcats in order to pursue her life of adventure and archaeology. No doubt her inspiration was Indiana Jones. So, in this process, she decided to form a team to help her when she was out spelunking in caves and caverns. Sheba. Sheba was a feline human who had some mad probability calculating capabilities. Savant would come across her when she was in the Amazon rainforest looking for artifacts. It is believed that Sheba is part of the Kindred, a mutated race of humanoid animals created by the Gen Factor. Mabel Blight. Mabel is Savant's best friend and one hell of a pilot. She definitely looks like she's got a lot more in store for her than she shows on the surface. This is especially clear when we see Mabel help Savant get out of negative headspace that she was in because of her bad leadership of the Wildcats. We knew next to nothing about her, except for a few remarks by her partner saying that she had apparently died a bunch of times before. Cybernary. Cybernary is a product of a union between Katrina Cupertino and Yumiko Gamora. While Katrina was a low-level street dealer, Yumiko was the daughter of the ruler Kazen Gamora. Their merging would be a very confusing one because of their obviously different personalities. Cybernary also had a bunch of attachments and enhancements on her body, like a built-in computer and modules that increase her strength and stamina. She is even able to generate and secrete pheromones from her skin that can be used to influence people. A quick note, however, that she has the ability to activate a system that will Disperse a water catalyzing agent, hence ending all organic life on Earth. Disperse. Disperse was a human mage from another dimension. As you can see, he came from the world of magic and used to be a freedom fighter there against the magical tyrannical overlords of his dimension. After fighting his battles in his home dimension, he is convinced to come into our world and travel with Savant and her entourage for some time. His main ability is shape-shifting. This ability of his is a little overpowered on paper because technically he can take the form and also command the abilities of anyone he changes into. 
met Elle. Katrina and Sisko were best friends. Sisko was a criminal from the underworld and was an absolute wretch. When a job they were pulling went downhill, Sisko got arrested. Once Katrina agrees to give her life in exchange for Sisko's freedom, we find that they were tricked, and Sisko instead was modeled and transformed into an animal-looking cyborg that would fight for Gamoran's entertainment. Once Cybernary had fought and essentially stopped what used to be her best friend, she downloaded a copy of her personality and thought process and put them into an automaton called met L. Miranda Miranda's role in the series is very short and simple, yet still quite important. She is basically a therapist for cybernetic people. She was the one who helped Cybernary understand and come to terms with her two personalities that were stuck into that one head, and it would also be her that would help and take care of met L later on. The Invincible Time Travel Team This was a team that was made of the Cash Brothers, Void and Hadrian's consciousness in one of the old Spartan bodies, along with a few others. Sister Eve She used to be a nun from South Bend, and she had no idea that she was Lord Entropy's daughter. She had the ability to create a chaos field that essentially breaks molecular bonds, so therefore, it was quite a destructive ability. Since she did not have the best control of her powers, however, she would wear gloves and a cloak to reduce its effects. Sadly, Sister Eve dies while trying to save her friends and team members from an avalanche. Olympia. Olympia was a demonite by birth and was raised in the arts of the Coda. When Max was killed by a Coda warrior, Olympia made it her personal problem to take revenge. However, in doing so, she angered Jacob Marlowe and was banned from the team. That being said, as long as she kept away from the Wildcats and their activities, she would not be harmed. Mythos. Mythos was a very strong Magus and a Carabim Lord. He had super strength, super speed, and could even move fast enough for humans to not even notice him. Was the show too ahead of its time? <laughs> Absolutely it was. This show, as I've mentioned before, falls in the same category as the X-Men animated show, and it still did so many things better. Whether it be the storytelling or even the action, the show was just overall enjoyable. It had a really catchy intro tune, and the all too familiar voice of Jacob Marlowe introducing an episode is just nostalgia in its purest form. Sure, we can say that it's taken influence from some other comic series, but it still has a very independent and individual feel to it. The action isn't bland at all, considering everyone has different powers. Good mix of these powers being used, along with some simple martial arts thrown in there as well. The story progression doesn't feel rushed, and actually flows quite well. It honestly is a bit of a shame that this show only got one season. In my opinion, it honestly could have gone on for a few more seasons. The other bit that's quite fun is actually the fact that there is some degree of drama to the characters as well, as it's not just the stereotypical superhuman stuff. There are humanizing traits in all of them, and they are all brought forward in various episodes. Some people may call the catchphrases too cringy, but but they really do fit the mood of a 90s cartoon, especially the consistency with which they use their lines is just either smack on perfect or just downright hilarious. Grifter was obviously our favorite character because he reminds us so much of Deadpool. I mean, come on. His mask almost looks identical to Deadpool's. That aside, the comedy and banter that Grifter provides is just really fitting for a person like him, and it also comes at some very welcome times. None of these characters are too much or overbearing, and they all have equal importance that has been given to them as well. They all have their own rightful place in the Wildcats team. Warning. Wildcat presence detected. Conclusion. Okay, so there you have it. We've gone over all of the most important characters in the Wildcats universe. It is definitely a really cool concept, obviously similar and comparable to other superhuman teams like the Avengers or the X-Men. However, maybe since some of the creators of these shows and stories overlap, we see some sides or aspects of the Wildcats that we don't necessarily see in others. Not just that, but since the creators know what really works and what really doesn't, well, they have created a really solid story that could potentially evolve into something much bigger, irrespective of the direction that it would take. You see, the characters have a lot of personality and depth to each of them. Their backstories are quite interesting, and nothing seems too unbelievable. The plots fit, and even though sometimes they can be unpredictable, they work in the favor of the story, and also, more importantly, the characters involved. Things like the way the Grifter talks, or how Zealot is just so fierce, not just in action, but also in the way of her thinking. And again, all this is backed up with good reasoning as well. So everyone, I really hope you enjoyed watching our video, and it was quite fun making it for you. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we hope to see you in the next one. And hey, if you liked our content, then don't forget to leave us a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time, I'm Rylan. Have a good one and be safe. Ah!